Good evening, everyone. We are back. It's the fall semester at Fresno State. And on behalf of the Armenian Studies Program, I'd like to welcome you to our first lecture in our fall lecture series. Um, it's going to be an exciting semester. We have uh, lots of different events uh, set up. And as you were looking at some of them, uh, in the month of September, we have two events coming up on September 22nd and 23rd. That's two weeks from tonight. We're going to be having uh, a conference uh, called Armenians, Kurds, Greeks and Kurds, A People's History of the Ottoman Empire. And eight scholars are coming from throughout the United States. And they'll be each speaking about different aspects of the history of the people that lived in the Ottoman Empire and the history told from their perspective, that is using Armenian sources. I'd like to invite all of you to come to that. We'll be having a, a reception with food and drinks between 6.30 and 7.30 p.m. on that Friday. And then the conference will continue uh, on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, also uh, here. So everything is taking place in this hall. And then on Friday, September 29th, the Armenian Studies Program and Senate Culture are sponsoring the showing of uh, The Promise. That's going to be in our other Peters Auditorium, the one that's near the Save Mart Center. And uh, coming to discuss the film after we show it will be the associate producer, Carla Garabedia. That's a free showing, but it is a very limited space. So if you're planning to come that night, make sure you come a little bit early. It's gonna start at five o'clock rather than the usual 5.30. But we'll be sending out our publicity and all of our other events uh, coming up as well. In October and November, we have uh, many more events coming up. So it's gonna be a full semester of activities here at uh, Fresno State. So tonight, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, our, our guest and about the lecture that's gonna take place. The lecture tonight is called 50 Years of Armenian Literature in France, a Zenith of Armenian Diasporan Literature. And uh, the, the book itself is called 50 Years of Armenian Literature. And it was published actually by the Armenian series here at Fresno State. So the Armenian Studies Program has uh, an opportunity to publish specific titles through the, the press at California State University Fresno. And as I said, this is the sixth volume that was published. And it's thanks to an endowment which was established by M. Victoria Karagosian Kazan and Henry S. Kanzakian Kazan. Some of you remember the Kazan family. Oh, some 20 years ago, they were visiting Fresno State. And as a legacy gift, uh, they left an endowment to help support our program. So we want to thank them. Among the titles in that series have been uh, a book of poetry by Diana Darovanesian, a book on the Armenian epic David of Sassoon, and a book of poetry by Lahan Kekane. Our guest tonight, Christopher Atamian, however, is here tonight to talk about uh, the book 50 Years of Armenian Literature because he is the translator of the book. The author is Kripor Bolivian from France. Kripor Bolivian is one of the foremost authors and literary critics living in, in Paris. And uh, it's his book, but it's translated into English by Christopher Batamian. And I think it's important because bringing works in other languages into the English language, of course, broadens the audience. Um, Bolivian wrote his uh, opus, it's a part essay, part textbook, in French, and he traces the fascinating history of a group of 40 or so Armenian writers, mainly genocide survivors, who all regrouped in Paris after the great catastrophe. So in a way, it's, it's, it's looking at one Armenian diasporan community, that in France. And actually, it's, it's something that I've been thinking about. Someday we have to compare the different diasporan literary communities in America, in France, and in different countries to compare how those uh, literary aspects are. Christopher Atamian is a writer. He's a filmmaker, a translator. He's a native New Yorker. He writes for such magazines as the New York, Book Time, uh, New York Times Book Review, the Weekly Standard, and the uh, New York Press. And he increasingly spends his hours writing mainstream pro projects, but remains attached to writing about and disseminating Armenian and cult uh, culture and literature. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Christopher Atomian. Um, so first of all, I want to thank Barlow and the Arena Studies Department at Fresno State for having me here. Um, I should say I'm not used to giving these types of lectures. I mean, usually I'm a writer, so I, I do book readings, and usually I'll write a book or translate something, and I'll just sit around with people and talk. So 
I have put together the semblance of a PowerPoint presentation, which I will walk through with you. Um, so it's really very quick, it's about 20, 25 minutes. And after that, I'm gonna read like one passage or two passages from um, where Spending Grow set up, and there's one of the writers who was part of his generation. And then I thought um, I would open it up to questions. Um, one of the reasons I'm doing it this way is because this book is 650 pages. And it basically describes an entire literary movement. And there's a lot of literary theory in it, um, which I'll talk about very briefly. Um, but it's almost impossible to get across in 40 minutes like the, the nuance and, and talk about 40 writers. It's almost like an impossible task. So I thought what I would do is give you an overview um, read a little bit and then just ask questions, have you ask me questions and that way I can maybe answer things that interest you more um, and then that'll be the format for tonight. So um, anyway, so the book is called 50 Years of Armenian Literature in France, From the Same to the Other. Well, and I subtitled it, or yes, I asked when culture is possible. Um, and the book was written by Kukor Kaledian in Paris, in French, and it basically describes um, a generation of post-genocidal writers. So they're all people that came from the Ottoman Empire um, after the genocide, um, and who wrote in Armenian in Paris. And the thing that is unique about um, what they did is they, they wrote for each other, and they had this entire um, community of Armenian writers who were poets, translators, um, but also people that wrote philosophical treatises, medical treatises they had, two daily publications, Harach and Andastan, at one point that were writing about what you'd read about in the New York Times, well, maybe not the New York Times, but, you know, like topical issues of the day, like everything from, you know, what's the new literary theory in France, um, a translation of Baudelaire's poetry into Armenian, the newest way to, like, remove a spleen, you know, from, I mean, this is the weirdest concatenation of things, but, and it was done in, in Western Armenian, and one of the things that I'm very interested in um, as I look at my own writing and, and what I'm going to be doing in the next couple of years, I really am invested in trying to save Western Armenian and the language and investigating how, as either a translator or a researcher, I can help do that. So um, I was very interested by the fact that they wrote in Armenian and that people read Armenian and that there's a, there's a way of existing in diaspora, if you want, and of passing on language and culture um, from generation to generation, and that involves, in part, culture, but also involves language. And I guess people here who are from Beirut or on the top of my hand, I'm really sure. And <laughs> half Italian, sorry. Um, so, um, and people who, you know, are from Syria or Lebanon know that they speak Armenian at home, but they also read in Armenian and have Armenian schools and have all these types of things that make that type of transmission possible. Um, so this movement lasted from 19... 22, roughly, which was the last year of genocide. Um, it doesn't include people like Bahan Tekeum, who came to France before that, or who had fled the Ottoman Empire before 1923. And it roughly ends in 1972, which is when Nigor Sarafin, the poet, passes away. And that's so, it's 50 years, which is, you know, a good chunk for any literary movement. So um, I'm reading um, Why Translate This Book. So, one, the importance of translation as a literary field. So, Translation is now taking on the importance of comparative literature, philosophy, like it's now come into its own as a field in the sense that it didn't in the past. So people would be like, oh, he's just a translator. But now there's a sense that a translated work is a work of literature and it's a unique work in and of itself. So that's one reason. Two, the importance of having an English edition of this modern classic. So this is actually the only book um, that is more than a guide to Armenian literature in the 20th century. Apart from Hadok Oshagan, who wrote a book called Han Batger, Panorama of Armenian Literature, um, there are other guides to Armenian literature, but they'll, they'll really, they'll say like, Joshma, or in this case, Hagop Baronyan, or whatever, and it'll tell you when he was born, and when he died, and what he wrote, and it might have an excerpt. But this is like really the only book, apart from Oshagan's book, that has an argument and that tells you basically, so if you look at the title, which is 50 Years of Armenian Literature in France, and the subtitle, From the Same to the Other, um, his theory is basically that Armenians who came from the Ottoman Empire had to go to the West 
to sort of understand who they were and how different they were from the West because they always existed sort of in a sub subordinate position in the Ottoman Empire, had their own culture, but had never really been able to, to see who they were as compared to the French or the British or British literature or you know whatever was being produced in the West. And since they were now thrust physically into France, in this case, or into Bulgaria or whatever the country was, they were able to actually see who they were as people, right? Because they were now like sort of drowning in this oven as well, in an Armenian, right? And that this permitted them to then come back to themselves. A lot of them went back to Turkey or to Beirut and, and taught again after that. So that, that's his argument. Whether or not it makes sense is you know another thing. So the third reason is to, that I translate books just literally to spread knowledge of Armenian literature and culture among Armenians and non-Armenians. So I think there's a need um, for people to understand where Armenian culture comes from, but also to understand the depth of it, that it actually has this beautiful literature. And this movement is unique because I think, apart from maybe Yiddish literature, like in Eastern Europe, there are very few examples of people who are able to transplant their entire culture to a completely different country and actually write and produce literature for 50 years. So in that sense, it's unique too. Um, the fourth thing was I just really wanted to, so there's something called world literature now if you go to universities, and it's basically more or less anything that's not like Western European and maybe like Yiddish or Jewish literature and or maybe like Asian, which I know nothing about, so I'm not going to talk about Asian literature. But so it's anything that's not considered a major literature. And so my hope was that by translating the book, now that people would have access to it, they would actually be able to know what had been written and then do future research on it. Because you can go in the back and you'll see that there's like 40 authors, there's a listing, pretty extensive listing of like all the works that were produced. So that if you're a research student or a graduate student, you can then just ask for the help, of, which is the way a lot of people find your topics, look at something and say, hey, this looks interesting. Start researching as an undergrad if you're at Fresno State, and maybe get a PhD after, and you know, start doing really important research that hasn't been done. I mean, there are 42, I count 42 writers, of which I'd say like 20 are pretty major, and almost nothing's been written on them. So it would be hard to find a book, even on Kostan Zadian, who's like this huge Armenian writer, or you know, I'm trying to think on Nartuni or, or any of these like, like Serafian, whose other book I translated was, like when I translated, there's absolutely nothing to do research on. So my hope is that people who are in the audience or people who want to study Armenian studies, whether they're Armenian or not, will pick this up and when they say, hey, these are the themes, this interests me, it doesn't interest me. And, um, so that's one of the reasons. Um, six which I talked about to help save Western Armenian and show they can be literate and have living language. So Western Armenian was placed on UNESCO's list of endangered languages two or three years ago, which means that there's 350,000 people that speak Armenian today, or fewer and fewer each generation. And so I think that sort of gives you an extra reason to understand your urgency in doing this. So, all right, so my next slide is, so I, I think that there's non-Armenians here as well. So all the writers came from the Ottoman Empire. I couldn't find like, a good map of Ottoman Turkey. So basically, they all came from Ottoman Turkey. They ended up in Paris. And the loop that he talks about from the same to the other, he talks about this loop that they made because they either went back to Turkey or then ended up in some of them in Beirut, like Serafian, or their works that are in Syria, or just stayed in France, but the work made its way back from them. So he talks about this sort of metaphor loop and the physical loop that they made. So anyway, that's not my argument, that's his. So this is Kripor Baledin. Um, he is the author. So I found pictures for you because I think it's nice to have like to know what these people look like because I used to see these old Armenian books with like this old alphabet. Like they actually try to make it impossible for you to read Armenian because they publish it like that big. And I bet I don't know what the guy looks like. I can barely read his writing. So this is Kripor. Um, and he's a poet, a novelist, a literary critic. He was born in Beirut in 1915. He attended uh, Nishan Kalanja, which is sort of like the big prep school in Beirut, or the top of prep school in any case. Um, and he holds PhDs in philosophy and comparative literature from the University of Nysak. Um, so he's quite a clever fellow. He's written over 30 works, mostly in Western Armenian. 
The main ones are um, anti-poem, which in Armenian is Hekar Kablats, Mantras, the fire circle around Daniel Barajan, Inversion, which in Armenian is Shoshum, Flop, which is Dharm in Armenian, and you know, a whole list of other books. And he's, um, he's just a fascinating guy, so um, you should look up his work and try to read it when you can. Um, so the Menk movement, which means, so Menk means we in Armenian, is actually the name of the literary movement itself, and it's called either the Paris School or the Menk movement. Um, again, it, it lasted from 1922 until 1972, and some of the characteristics is that it's a literature of exile, so that implies certain positions, themes, and issues, which is basically that these are people who are trying to figure out who they were, how their culture fit into the West, um, and who had certain themes. So some of the themes were of the genocide, foreignness, there's always like a beautiful like French woman who's usually either a prostitute or a virgin who like tempts the like dark Armenian who doesn't know if you should then marry the Armenian girl from the village or if you should let go of like French whore. I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, they're not necessarily subtle themes. There are also some books that deal with the actual genocide, so, um, and so it's, you know, it's a literature of, of catastrophe. So if you're interested in genocide literature or literature having to do with the Holocaust, whether it's a Jewish Holocaust or the Rwandan Holocaust more recently, it's a very interesting um, series of books to read because they all have these similar themes. Um, and you tend to always read the same books, right? Like Diary of Frank, blah, blah, blah. After a while, you might want to find something a little bit different. So that also gives you, um, these books give you sort of um, an opening onto a, a more, I think, a wealthier and a richer um, source of inquiry. So that is number one. So, so some of the themes that I mentioned are genocide, exile, the confrontation with the other, um, and often the annihilation of the Armenian soul, meaning that these are people who are unable to really survive in, in France more than one or two generations. So they wrote, typically they would come, they would meet other Armenians, they would write in Armenian, the second generation would sort of speak the language of it, and by the third generation they were not speaking Armenian and sort of fully integrated into French society. So, um, so often a lot of books are about this like loss of perceived Armenianness. Um, some of the other themes are the East versus the West, Europe versus the Orient, the world of pleasure versus the world of work, because a lot of these people have these amazing lives where they live in temporary camps, for example, in Marseille, in France. And the thing I like about this book is it's also a history book. So I learned a huge amount about the way Armenians after the genocide lived in Europe. So they would work all day in these factories and they lived in these temporary camps in Marseille and Paris at first, and now were built. And then they, they would go out and party. Mm -hmm. They would like go to dances all night and they would try to like, get a kind of life or just have fun or do whatever you do. And so, um, you know, they had lost their childhood a lot. And so they were trying to make up for loss of family, loss of territory, and just try to figure out how you function as an immigrant. So I also thought that was really interesting. Um, so that, those are the main themes. <laughs> Um, I'll try to get through this quickly. Um, so the third thing that I found interesting about the Manc or the Wee movement in general is that there's a linguistic issue, right? Um, there's also the idea of diasporic life and contact with other languages. And the interesting thing is that for Armenians, as for other people, the contact with um, either foreign languages or foreign cultures was nothing new. It's been going on since the fifth century. So. Both Armenian literature, the Armenian language, and Armenian culture have been influenced by Assyrians, Turks, Persians, Russians, Poles. I mean, everything you could possibly imagine, short of the kitchen sink, has influenced Armenian. There's always think, oh, is Armenian culture pure? Is this culture pure? And you realize that it's really an amalgamation of both linguistically, culturally, and in terms of literature. So, what I found really interesting with the Armenian literature in Paris was that um, you have this sort of contact with a literature that's considered higher or better or, or better known. And then you have the Armenians who took poets like Baudelaire, Berlin, Sandral, these major writers like Surrealism, Existentialism, all these huge movements, and they were able to integrate it into Armenian. And they wrote existential poetry, they wrote surrealistic poetry like 
Serafian in particular, in Armenian. And so they were able to show that Armenian was both was a rich literary language, and they were able to take these influences and do something that was really quite unique. So, you know, this is some languages of Syrian, Aramaic, Farsi, Turkish, Georgian. Um, there's even something called Hellenic Armenian, which was heavily influenced by Greek, and a lot of, um, well, Sergio probably knows better than I do, but a lot of the, um, um, a lot of the Old Testament and texts that were written at the time um, survived because of the Hellenic Armenian. There's something called Kipchak Armenian, which is our Turkish version of the Armenian alphabet, so that it was Armenians living in Turkey who spoke Turkish, but who read the Armenian alphabet. So it's like reading, it's like reading Turkish with Armenian letters. So, um, yeah, go ahead. I'm curious, what is Kipchak? What I have no idea. It's, I think it must be some type of Turkic trap. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know. It's just called Kipchak Turkish. Does anyone know? Yeah, so try, Kipchak is a, is a branch of the old Turkish language. Right, yeah, so, right, so if I'm saying something completely wrong, again, I'm not a literary historian, so um, just correct me. So the make movement for, so cultural historians, what I think was missing, if you are a literary historian, is that we have, again, histories of Armenian writers and literature. So the Vantaramasya, Nashot Abrahamian, Arshad Abuyatan, Minas Tulalian, who um, recently passed away not long ago, all wrote histories of Armenian literature, but none of them had a central argument to them, right? So the argument here is how, as an Armenian after the genocide, as a writer, you face the West, you face its literature, you face its supposed superiority, how you integrate it, and then what you do with it. More or less. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, so, um, Baladian's book, I think, is important because of that. So, the Mech Movement 5. So, these are some of the other things in this movement that you can read about in this book. So, you have literary historians and critics like Kiham Sivan, Vaskin Kaprielian, Minas Filalian, Hagel Bichan. You have poets, Nero Serafian, Kuzan Tapalian, um, Misak Manukian. I don't know if you guys know Misak Manukian. They've made a couple of movies about, like, major movies in France about him. He was a revolutionary who lived through the Armenian genocide, moved to France, started a couple of literary movements, wrote a couple of very important books of poetry, but he also became a resistor, and um, his group, which is called the FTP Moi, basically blew up Nazis. There was, it was him, a couple of Armenians, and a lot of Jews and Poles, and they would go around blowing up Nazi officers and Nazi positions, and they were all executed like in 1945, like almost at the end of the war. Misak Minukin, and they supposedly, each one of them when they died, um, said for the glory of France, which makes you cry when you see the movie, especially if you like France, but anyway. So, um, so, and the reason I'm pointing all these things out is just, I don't know if I'm getting it across again, but it's just to show the incredible, what I really love about the book, and so I think you should buy it and read it, is because you get this incredible um, variety of people and variety of opinions about um, Armenian culture from different writers, um, you know, the feuds that some had over communist Armenia, should you support communist Armenia, or should you only have um, an Armenia that's independent and free, quote unquote, which is basically the Tashna versus the non-Tashna split at one point. Um, and you have an illiterate sense, and you see that people would argue about this on a daily basis. Um, and some people, like Zabel Yisayan, and I'll talk about in a minute, was a very important feminist in the Yaman Empire, actually went back to Armenia, and then they were all executed by the Armenian KGB, more or less. So you have this really lovely history, which is sad sometimes, but always fascinating. So you have novelists also like Kaba Boshagan, Kostan Zarin, Shavar Shnartuni. I don't know if these names mean anything to people. I, I didn't know a lot of these writers. So um, so this is my favorite. This guy is Nigor Sarafin, and he wrote The Conquest of Space. Um, he wrote 14, he wrote Citadel, he wrote the Guadmasan, which I'm going to read about before I take your questions, and he wrote a book called uh, Mediterranean, and he was very important because for this entire generation in Beirut in the 70s of young students who were studying at Alanjan Agassin University, which is an Armenian university in Beirut, they read Serafian in Armenian, and he was modern, 
and he was the first writer to really take all of these French movements and Western movements and write Western Armenia is very beautiful. I mean, if, if I could read here, I mean, too, I would, but I don't have it here. Um, it's just stunning poetry and prose poetry. And it basically, some people argue, like Mark Nishanian, who's a critic, that he, in and of himself, almost saved or created an entire new generation of writers and people who are interested in Armenian literature in Beirut amongst the young intelligentsia. It's a little bit of an exaggeration. I mean, it's not, it wasn't just him. But you know that's why I think it's important to, like when you're translating, you think, oh, what the hell am I doing this? Because even if it's one or two people who then get interested and then are able to carry something on, you never you know where that's going to lead. So I don't think he ever thought that he would be that important to Beirut Armenian intellectuals, but he was. So um, Hagab Oshagan is also part of this movement. He wrote The Humble Ones, Remnants, which is Manat Sortas, which is one of the most important books of Armenian literature, which is about the prison system in the Ottoman Empire that the Armenians suffered under, and then the genocide was left. So um, he also wrote Kamal Batge Hagadan Karagonikan, which is Panorama of Armenian Literature, which is an enormous opus, which is 3,000 pages on Armenian literature of the 20th century. And he, I would argue, with um, with the legend have basically saved the history of Western Armenian literature. Because the thing that you need to understand also about Armenian literature and culture was that for seven years, because the Soviet Union was basically cut off in two, and the Soviets basically would not let, they would either adulterate and change the, li the little bit of Western Armenian literature they let in, or they basically censored it completely. So that if there hadn't been these works, there is nowhere else you could find, I mean, where you can go find out about Armenian writers from the Ottoman Empire, like it's almost, you know, there's no research done. So, um, so Oshagan and now Valenian, I think really, in these two books have done this huge favor to the world and to Armenian literature. So he is an amazing guy. Remnants came out a couple of years ago in English, mm -hmm. and Orca Branyan translated, oh sorry, that wasn't up, so those are the three books. Remnants came out on, I think it's Yale University Press, so you can actually buy it in English. And around that, if you ever want to read 3,000 pages of very crisp and in Armenian, it is out in Atalias in Beirut. So, Shavar Shnartuni is another one of the writers. These aren't the greatest pictures, I'm sorry. Um, he wrote Jerusalem, Jerusalem, The Bee's Speech, Here I Am, Thanks Baird, The Mass of Nard. Um, Shahan Shanur um, is another one of these writers in the book. He's particularly interesting because he wrote um, both as Shahan Shanur, he wrote um, Retreat of That Song and a pair of red notebooks. Retreat of that song, again, is this very complicated story about an Armenian guy who falls in love with a French woman and the sort of family intrigue that happens and his choices in Paris, but it's sort of a metaphor for Armenian versus Western culture, broadly speaking. But he also wrote French, as uh, Armand did that. He had a lot more success writing in French, so Transfer Martin was actually a pretty successful book in French. Um, and it's interesting, again, that I think a lot of these writers like this guy, Zare Orkuni, was, um, were conscious that by writing in Armenian, they were basically giving up a chance at commercial success. And they made that choice. Some wrote perfectly fine French, some didn't, but some could have. And, um, and he was the only one that wrote in both. But so Zare Orkuni, he was like really like annoyed and hounded by the fact that no one read his books. So the candidate, the third book that he wrote, so he wrote Room to Let, Kohari and other short stories, and the candidate was just translated, sorry, a little bit of um, feedback, by Jennifer Mnookin. So you can buy that in English too. So I'm just pointing out the books that you can actually read in English as we go through. Um, so she's my favorite. I adore this woman. I would marry her. I would care of her children. <laughs> but she's dead. Um, <laughs> so Zaba Yaseyan was a brilliant woman who was born into a very wealthy Armenian family, or that was wealthy at one point over tax and losing her money by the time the genocide happened. But she, um, two or three Armenian, who were actually the leading feminists in the Ottoman Empire. Um, and she wrote a beautiful book called Amidst the Ruins, um, which uh, is really interesting because um, she was sent by the Armenian patriarch of Constantinople to Adana 
after the Adana massacres in 1909. So in 1909, the Turkish government basically um, incited riots in the Christian quarter that were interpreted by the Turkish <coughs> part of Adana as being an attack on the Muslim quarters. And they retaliated by massacring 35,000 Armenians. And she was sent to report on what she found and just to document it. And the interesting thing is it starts off and she writes to my fellow Ottoman citizens, and she's writing to both Turks and Armenians, because at the time she considered Armenians concerned themselves to be Ottoman citizens, and didn't necessarily differentiate. I mean, they knew that they weren't Ottoman, that they weren't Muslim, they knew they weren't Turkish, but there was a sense of unity to it. And it's an absolutely harrowing book. Like, you really have to be able to read through pages and pages of children who have been mutilated, and, you know, entire, like, churches of Armenians burned to the ground. But it's, it's an eyewitness story to the 1909 massacres, and it was a warning to her own people, but she never really thought that the genocide would take place. She thought it was an aberration. So it's an interesting book to read. Um, she wrote The Gardens of Silidar, which is completely different. The Gardens of Silidar is a stunning, very beautiful description of the neighborhood in Istanbul, in Constantinople, called Silidar. And it's just a very beautiful description of Muslim, Christian, Greek Moors, the gardens, the traditions, the weddings. Um, and that's available in French and in English as well now. So um, the interesting thing about W. Sam is that she then spent eight years in Tiflis transcribing what happened during the genocide, moved to Paris, where she lived with these other writers who are describing here. And then she moved back to Yerevan, taught at the university, and she was rounded up with like two other, three other great Armenian writers and basically disappeared I and mean, was murdered by Armenians, by the KGB, by the Armenian KGB. So um, we don't know where she is. And there's a new documentary, you can look up on, you can Google documentaries about Elias Sam, which was done by um, a two, uh, Istanbul Armenian and an Armenian American. And it's really interesting because there's actually a street in Yerevan called Zavadiya Sam Palazzo, which is Zavadiya Sam Street. And they go around asking people to live on the street. They, they say, Who's Sam? No one knows, right? So, to me, like when I was translating this book, I thought, you know, this is the, the, you know, the sort of level we've gone to, where people who even live on a street in Armenia named after Zavoli Sam don't know who she was. So I think it it just reinforced my desire to like bring the book out and sort of tell people about the literature. And um, she's really a wonderful woman. Um, and, and a brilliant writer. She's probably, I think, one of the best writers of the early 20th century. Um, so this dude with a big Armenian nose and very like striking is Kostan Zayan. And he wrote um, a couple of very important books, The Crown of Days, The Tan Poop and the Man of Bones, which is a strange title in English. But he also wrote A Ship on a Mountain, which is sort of a biblical me metaphor. It's about a guy who buys a ship in Batumi and he wants to go back to Armenia, and it's about the whole debate over Soviet Armenia, not Soviet Armenia's sort of modern Armenian identity and who we are as a people. And it's a really wonderful book. Um, I don't have an excerpt for you, that's a mistake. Um, and so these are, this is just a list of other people um, who were writers in this, um, you know, in this movement, the Meg movement. Um, the Zartarian brothers are saying because there are three of them. Um, and they're obviously very good writers. Lots, Louisa Asanyan was an activist who fought the Nazis and she was gassed at Auschwitz. So um, Arshad Kishabani is a very important guy who started a couple of different publications. Um, so I mean, it's really an amazing bunch of people. Um, and I mean, I didn't know there were any Armenians at Auschwitz, and there were. So um, it, her and her husband were actually gassed. So. Um, Marianne Mazin was an important feminist also. There weren't that many women in the movement, which is not surprising. So my conclusions are, um, and these are not my conclusions, they're the Lenin's conclusions. Um, all these writers had come to the West in order to understand their own relation to the West and to themselves. Um, they're a proof of survival and post-genocidal um, existence, and a link to the provincial writers of the past and writers like Takayan. So if you know, if you study Armenian literature, in the Ottoman Empire, these provincial writers that came from the east, 
and then moved to Istanbul along with a lot of migrations um, when the villages were being depopulated and um, they're sort of forced out of traditional Armenia and Western Armenia. Um, but they had these writers who were considered like Zartarian, um, like Tiglidian Sea was another one, um, Bahante Kayan. And so this school is actually a link to those writers because the, the link to the Soviet Armenian writers is completely broken. They weren't read, they weren't studied. And so this is actually a sort of like living link. And it was in Paris, which is pretty amazing, I think, um, that this happened in French. And I think Farlo talked about um, you know, studying other diaspora communities. I don't think there's anything quite like this. I think it has a little bit to do with French culture, which was always very cosmopolitan. I think it has to do with the fact that French literature at the time was taking off, so you had this effervescence, I guess, in Paris of uh, writers who permitted it. So, um, and I think it was really um, an important sort of link and, and sort of reprieve for Western Armenian um, both in the West and in Beirut, and for another generation, there are many films and readers of Western Armenian. So it, in a sense, helped to save Western Armenian in the West, in France, and to help give it sort of um, a literary kick in the ass in the Middle East as well. Um, I don't know why there aren't more Armenian writers from Beirut and held up in these places, but there aren't. Um, so future directions. This is just me talking. I think we need more translations. I mean, I think we should form a translation institute. So of all of these works, and there are about 400, or 300, 350 I counted, six have been translated into English and about 20 into French. So that gives you an idea. I certainly haven't read all of them. Very few people have, even in Armenian. So um, I think it's important when you, if you're Armenian, you're considering like donating money. I think it's important to have schools um, day schools, places that actually teach the language, and that can, because to be able to translate from Armenian, you have to be able to understand it well enough to translate it from the original, and to speak both languages as mother tongues, otherwise it's almost impossible to translate. Um, and you know, you look at Hebrew, you look at Yiddish, these are like, Hebrew is completely extinct up until 100 years ago, and now there's a whole country that speaks it. So I don't think it's that much late. I, I know that there are, day schools in LA and in different parts of the world, but I think um, this is one more argument for, for supporting the study of language and, and the schools in general. Um, and I would love to see the creation of world-class Armenian cultural centers that are not religious, you're not affiliated with parties, but they just present Armenian culture, writers, musicians, artists. You know, you could have a reading group of one of these books, right? You could do, there's so many things you could do that we don't do. Um, I know there's, only so much money and so many resources, but that's what I came away when I, you know, people say, what, what was your big takeaway? My big takeaway was that Armenian literature really was as rich as any other literature in the 20th century, who knew, right? Um, and that um, there's all sorts of things you can do when you actually know the culture well enough and you read it and you want to contribute. So that's really it. I was gonna read two pages and then maybe, up and bore everyone. Yeah. Um, Okay, so, um, so Nikolaus Sarafian was um, one of the leaders of this movement, and he wrote a lot of different books, so poetry, post-poetry, philosophy. There is a manifesto about it. There is something called the Menk Manifesto, but it's very garbled. It's, it doesn't really have a point. It's more like 10 things you should do or 10 things that their Armenian literature might be, but it's not like the Surrealist Manifesto, which is you know, really rich and interesting, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But um, so this is him, kind of as a guy. Um, and the Boy Vincent is like um, the big park, one of the big parks in Paris, although like Central Park in the Um And he writes about the history of Armenian culture and the history of World War II and the history of France as he goes to work and comes back every day. And it's actually really quite beautiful in Armenian, but I'm going to read you two pages in English if you can bear with me. Um, so, um, all right, so this is chapter two. The Bois de Massin is enticing. The trees are witches at times. Oh, oh, and by the way, it's, this is in this book, but only half of it's in here, so I want to read you the whole thing to what I'm reading from here and not from the actual book. So, okay. 
Um, the blood of my son is enticing. The trees are witches at times. Magicians wearing cruel wooden masks. Demons who whistle on cold winter nights. Gypsies who foretell the future. A spirit emerges from within a leaf, and the woods become chaotic under the sun. The entire length of the forest vibrates with metallic sounds that echo off one another. A landslide rumbles, and then a magnetic current passes by. The ground trembles like a negro in a trance. One of the spirits throws down a gold coin. A horse chestnut rolls onto a path, bounces back up, and then explodes, letting loose from its resplendent green skein a shiny fruit that looks up at the world askew like some grazed, wild colt. The dead leaves lift themselves up and flee like the undulation of a long wedding train. An invisible spirit suffers at the bottom of a waxen riverbed as the sun's rays embed themselves like in many witches' needles. And a frightened bird screeches over and over again while another one moans and yet another sings its lamentation to the skies. One hears a moan of a pregnant woman. And when everything quiets down and silence descends on the sylvan surroundings, from one end of the woods to the other, a celestial music rises into the air. A child is born. The soft oil of goodness pours forth from its branches. The trees become wise men bearing like gifts, lambs of Christ. The void of that sand is beguiling. Buried under a winter cloak of snow, the trees are angels who beat their white wings in the sky. The angels whisper of a lost heaven, and at night they become ivory shrouds, somnambulists sleepwalking through the moonlight. Snow covers them like powdered sugar. And when enough accumulates near the frozen ponds, under the setting light of nightfall, the powder shines like a birthday cake and glistens like the New Year's Eve's of my lost childhood. The trees are monsters drowning in the autumn rain. In this place, life is a fable. There are trees who tell tales and children who live them. At times, the trees form entire armies that do battle mercilessly, sword against sword, horse manes waving in a wind, helmets waving as well, and thousands of wind-beaten banners. Some trees are troubadours, while other trees sing canicles. There are priests who swing censers and shake fans, while pagan cantors and plane trees await together the arrival of a prince. There are also poets and heroes of a revolution. And sometimes when a storm explodes ferociously out of nowhere, the trees are an entire people massacred and sent into exile. There are women and children screaming in the wind. Some trees look like executioners and thieves, while others limp and are hunched over. Some are wealthy, others poor. In the springtime, as in summer, veiled courtesan dance in the wind. One of the willows shakes her large, proud stomach, and her hips vibrate like cords under the sun's rays, which reflect out of the water and stream through his lo her long, undone hair. There are trees that know only heartache, while others straddle the sky between their legs. And then there are triumphal arches. So that's chapter two. And then to finish, there's this wonderful quote. It's actually four lines of poetry by the same poet, um, which I think is symbolic of the movement and of sort of Armenian culture in the 20th century and of that point in time. So, um, where is it? Find it. It was somewhere here. Oh yeah, okay, so so this is, so that was prose poetry, right? Sort of like poetic prose or poetry that's sort written of as prose. This is like more what you would recognize as regular poetry. So, um, and this is based on the myth of the phoenix. So, in these orange lights, wide open, in these flames, red the morning is our charred soul, infinite, burnt but always born again, and rising luminous like the phoenix, born again from its ashes. So, that's how I was going to end it. And um, if you have any questions, feel free.
went to Armenian camp, so I could say like, <laughs> I could like I could go I pimp him like I need alphabet. I knew four songs, like stuff he's stuff he's doing. Yeah. And, um, I could insult your mother, your father, and all that. Well, that was like the limit of my Armenian. I could read the alphabet. Um, yeah, I mean, no, I, I can read slowly, mm -hmm. um, but I don't speak, like, I never speak Armenian. I mean, not never, but rarely. Like, when I go to Armenia, then I speak Eastern Armenian, so it's a little bit different. But, so I translate a little bit, I was telling Sergio before to press over Armenia, I try, when I translate, it's not quite like Latin. You know, when you take a sentence and you look for the subject and the verb, and the, but it's a little bit like that. So. I'll read a paragraph, I'll know the general idea of it, on a 70% of what it's about, or 80%, and then I have to make sure that every word, especially with like Serafian, um, because his Armenian is very, very rich, like Oshagan, so there are triple meanings and double meanings. So like I called like, um, like Ada Oshagan, I was like, what the hell does this word, does this word mean this? He's like, yeah, but it also means like it's, it's you know, um, street language for, for cool or whatever. So those types of things I don't know, which you have to know if you're gonna like translate. So this book I translated from Armenian, it was um, like 70 pages long, it took me two years. Well, I was doing other things at the same time, but I mean, a page would take me three, four weeks. Wow. So how long did the, the second stage? This? Year and a half. That's all? But, well, my, I, I, I can translate French through my site. But still, it's, it's like long, and it's like, and then, well, it's 600 pages, but then like, you know, you have like the, the texts, which are single space, so it's more like eight or 900 pages, when you add it all up. And, um, you know, you get tired after a while. Like, your brain stops to function. I mean, it's fascinating, but it's not exactly like rock science. So, um, anyone, any questions? Yeah, so I see that you oh. wanted to stress Sorry. the Armenian schools, yeah. day schools. Yeah. But because now when you were young, you didn't have that ability. Well, we don't have any in New York anyway. We still don't. There's a Hovnanian school in New Jersey, which goes up to eighth grade. There's Holy Martyrs, which goes up to sixth grade. There was a Tashlan school, which closed. And that's it. So you can basically, and the Hovnanian schools in New Jersey, which is like not anywhere near where I live. Um, so, the only Armenian education you could get is Sunday school, where you also have to listen to the religion, so if you can stomach that, which a lot of people can and some can't. Um, you can go up to sixth grade, and that's it, and then you have a sixth grade reading ability. So in LA, it's different. Los Angeles has like six high schools. Right. And I have friends who send their children to Armenian school. Like, uh, my friend Dikim Derberian is an amazing writer in English, went to um, Kilibos, which is a tough one school, and LA loved it, speaks fluent Armenian, fluent English. Not hampered, doesn't speak English with an accent. So, hi. Yes? I wasn't teaching Armenian in school for 40 years, and the last 30 years uh, in a high school. Oh. And I taught 8 to 12. Got it. All are sitting, not in Beirut. Uh, 20 in Beirut, 20 here. Uh, all our students read literature right. after after they graduated it was gone because they go to college it's English and right. they cannot think enough Armenian to read literature and understand right or but I think you know part of that has to do with um, Part of, so I went to a French lycée from K from kindergarten to ninth grade, and I went to an American high school. Um, and when I see my friends, so first of all, four people in my class are writers who publish in France, including Amini Noton, who's sold 36 million books, is like the biggest French seller, whatever. When we see each other, we speak French. None of us are, well, some of us are, some of them are French, some are Belgian, most of us are American. So I think a lot of it has to do with and I don't mean this at all like as a slight or whatever, I think a lot of it has to do with the quality and the quantity of the education that they get in Armenia, how many hours, whether it's, you know, how it's presented, whether they then stay in a community that speaks Armenian, like in Beirut, or if they don't, 
And I think it's hard if you've never then taught the language, whether it's, you know, I don't know, whether it's German, Swahili, French, Quechua, whatever it is, you need to practice it. So I think there also have to be, there has to be a conscious effort to somehow form communities that, that pass them along. These things help, you know, and if they were just more of it, I think you would actually see like sort of a little explosion of translations. Yes, I do. Silly reaction. 
And so I think nowadays we have like professional translations, like people who have PhDs or who are studying, or in my case I say complete as an undergrad, so I've already translated from other languages, so I know how to approach it, which is sort of like the second stage. And I think if we get to the point where we have more of what Sergio was talking about, but for like Western Armenian, well for modern Armenian as opposed to classical Armenian, um, then I think you reach, in my mind, sort of the goal, which is to have at least a constant flow of things being well translated. Doesn't matter if it's every Armenian novel, but at least two or three a year come out. And, and I just heard the candidate, the John Kermigian translated, it's, it's sort of a great book. It's got a lot of action, it's got sex, it's got like everything. I mean, it's like, you know, you could be reading like, not quite a James Bond novel, but something from, you know, from the 30s that is interesting, it has interesting like, um, dialogues and philosophy in it, so, and I'd never heard of a book. I mean, I'd heard of it because I translated this, but to me it was just like a line in a book, so that's to answer your question along the way. about is the idea that they have that they're physically displaced or culturally displaced. Um, and he has this quote from Serafin which says, um, you know, we were thrown out to sea, but that's perhaps the best way to learn how to swim. So we're basically stuck in this crappy Ottoman Empire for how many hundreds of years. We were sort of the intellectual leaders of it, but who the fuck cares, excuse my language, because it's the Ottoman Empire, which wasn't exactly like the fine fleur of literature or anything by the end of the well, by the beginning of the 20th century, it really wasn't. Um, so there is, there's this idea of, um, of where they stand, both vis-a-vis -vis the West and Western literature, but where they stand vis-a-vis -vis themselves as individuals, and then vis-a-vis -vis their Armenian past, and the Armenian writers that either were completely different from them, or that were from a read. So the realist and a regionalist writers that they came immediately after were very prosaic. They wrote about village life. They wrote about like fishermen and Adaf Hazar, wherever they're from. Um, and so there is a semblance of what you're talking about again with a lot of these writers. And that's interesting when you sort of the justification for what happens. If you're looking at the Armenian writers in the Ottoman Empire at the beginning of the 20th century, they're slightly ahead of American writers in English in terms of their literary currency. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you read like Tuzan Tatalian or Nigor Sarafin, the, the, the language is very, it's, um, it's experimental, it plays with rhymes, it's got weird surrealistic imagery, like it's got the types of things that, I don't know if it ever hit American, I mean American literature is a weird thing unto itself, right? I mean, because you go from 19th century realist literature to like the beats and I don't know what's in between, Harper Lee. Um, but, um, I don't mean that in a negative way, I like Harper Lee. I think in the 60s yeah. and 70s, uh, Jack on Triassian on the East Coast, through AGBU and the diocese, he had a bunch of uh, authors translated. Yeah, I mean, here's the other one. It was Jack Montreal and Misha Putin. But I don't know how, I don't know how good a lot of it was, to tell you the truth. And a lot of it's out of print, too. So I'm coming out with a, well, actually, Barlow, can I talk about the Kelsey book? You can talk about it. So we may, I think, we're coming out with this other book that I already said I translated by Vedras Kelsey called, um, I mean, I got high book yet, and so Armenian American short stories. And these were written by Bedros Kaljic, whose um, cousin was also an Armenian provincial writer, but he moved from Minnesota, and before that lived in Chicago and New York, and he wrote these amazing, they're like these, they're so well written and sort of interesting and at the same time misogynistic and racist, 
you know, he's like, oh, the guy sells carpet, he's got a big nose, he looks like a Jew. I mean, it's like these ridiculous, you're like, oh my god, I can't believe you wrote. But they're, they're very precise portraits of where American culture was in sort of urban centers at, in the 1920s and 1930s, and views of religion, and views of like women, which are also get the Irish all drunk. I mean, it's like every awful stereotype, but it's a really important document of American literature and Armenian literature. Um, and these are, you know, these were translated for first time by Iris maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So you have all these really interesting um, things that still have, that still can be, and these, to answer your question, had been translated first by someone else at one point, but very badly, to the point that they were unreadable. And Iris's translations are quite good. So it's not just a question of what was translated, but was it well translated? Is it, is it, does it have an introduction that explains in a much more intelligent way what I just said? about stereotypes and, and the milieu of love is in a Bowery in New York, in the old Bowery, which is actually Skid Row, sort of. And like the first Armenian like carpet shops that were set up, and like Armenian Protestant preachers that came, and like swindlers, like the preachers who were good preachers, the preachers who were bad preachers. I mean, so it's this whole, um, and actually it's interesting because I was told that he also wrote about Boston, and that a cultural historian from Harvard that was doing a history of one of the squares, like. Quincy Market now in Boston, which used to be called something else, used one of the short stories because it actually describes which stores were next to each other. So you know you contribute to urban history, and because he couldn't find it for whatever reason in the Boston Library, you have a short story that's in Boston work. So he used that. I was told. So I mean, there's all these sort of interesting. I mean, you know, if you're in Silicon Valley and you want to make eight billion dollars in the computer industry, it might not interest you. But if you're interested in cultural history and these types of things, it's actually kind of fascinating. So, um, so that was a very long answer to say, but yes, there, there has been stuff that translated, but I swear it's not more than 12 or 14 books. And a lot of them are like folk tales, Armenian folk tales, like there are all these books, which are fine, but it's not necessarily the whole story. Or like a book of lamentations or prayers or whatever, so. Um, is there anything else anyone wants to ask or kind of be merciful and make also? Thank you, uh, thank you, Christopher. And um, I think you know the, the important points that he brought up um, is just the question of uh, bringing to the attention of a broader audience uh, some of the masterpieces of Armenian literature. And uh, a book like this um, really does bring that attention to some very, uh, very important Armenian writers whose works have been understudied in Armenian literature. Um, so I hope that you have a chance when you go out to take a look at the book. We have some coffee and desserts. We'd like to um, welcome you and say come on out and speak to our uh, speaker. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks at our international conference on the Armenians, Greeks, and the Kurds. And then um, a week after that, we'll see you at the conference. Thank you, and uh, we'll see you then. Thank you.